All right, thank you, Brother Matt. Matthew chapter number 15, please, uh, in your Bibles, in the Word of God. Matthew chapter number 15. As we have been on the subject of worship, and there's so much in the Bible about this particular subject, and this Word is found everywhere in the Word of God. Uh, I imagine you caught this morning that when Peter went to Cornelius' house, and when Peter entered into his house, what is the first thing that Cornelius did? Anybody remember from this morning when Peter went into Cornelius' house? He bowed down and worshipped Peter. And does anyone remember what Peter did when he saw Cornelius do that? Peter said, get up, I'm just a man. And that reminded me, and it, it should remind us all, we worship God only. And our Heavenly Father and our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ, a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. And that's who we worship. He is the only one that deserves worship. Um, and tonight in Matthew 15, we will look at uh, another uh, very interesting story, in, in my opinion. The title tonight is Worshiping for Crumbs. Worshiping for Crumbs. Matthew 15 and verse number 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. For she said, and she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. As we've read this story tonight, this is really one of those instances, probably the first, where Jesus interacts and ministers to a Gentile woman. And uh, the two cities, Tyre and Sidon, are in Phoenicia. At this time, we're in Phoenicia. They'd be in present-day Lebanon. Uh, according to our map. But just north of Israel, there were two coast cities that were on the Mediterranean Sea. And if you can just have an idea in your mind about commerce and trade and business, Tyre and Sidon were huge business trade cities. Uh, there were two ports that were there on the, on the Mediterranean coast, and ships would come in and ships would go out and goods would come in and goods would go out and business was, were established. And these would be culturally uh, very metropolitan areas. They would be uh, uh, culturally not, not, uh, not part of Israel. They, they are really condemned uh, somewhat in, in the New Testament and Old Testament because these were two cities that the nation of Israel should have had victory over, but they did not have victory over them when they traveled through the land of Canaan. The cities of Tyre and Sidon somewhat remained, and they maintained their false worship. They maintained their false gods. They maintained uh, their... their uh, uh, their, their worship of, of, of Baal and, and others. And so uh, these two cities sort of remained under the judgment of God. And even now until this present day that we are reading today, the cities of Tyre and Sidon would uh, have nothing, uh, uh, no connection to the, the uh, ministry of the Jews. They would have no connection to David. They would no, have no, uh, absolutely no connection to worship. But interesting, although the cities of Tyre and Sidon have no connection to worship, we find this woman from Tyre and Sidon worshiping. And you know we've been studying this word worship. And as Peter had to learn that the Lord Jesus loves and the gospel is for Gentiles as well as Jews, uh, this is one of those stories that, let's just be honest, Peter knew that Jesus loved Gentiles. Jesus was often ridiculed for ministering to Gentiles. And you can see the spirit of the average Jew here when they said, just send her out of here. Right? Did you want to read that? Just get rid of her. Why are you even letting her stand by us? This is just such a nuisance. And, uh, and that was sort of typical to the Jewish 
mindset and perspective is that the Messiah and God and the love of God and the favor of God is for us. Everybody else, just get out of here. We don't want anything to do with you. And, uh, and Peter, as we learned this morning, had to learn, and I believe did learn, that uh, the gospel is in pursuit of everyone, and the Lord Jesus loves even the Gentiles. And this was one of those stories that Peter saw with his eyes, or events that he saw with his eyes. I think in this text, one thing that came to my mind was an agonizing mother. And as you read there in verse number 22, this woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter. And I stopped there with those two words, my daughter. Um, nothing grieves a mother's heart like pain in a, for her children. Uh, I think it's true for both parents, whether a father or a mother. But at least I've witnessed in my family that I, I believe that my wife's pain when one of our children is hurting is greater than my pain. And I hurt when our kids hurt. But maybe it's just sort of a dad's uh, personality that says, uh, you'll be all right. <laughs> it's no big deal. You're okay. But I believe God has built into the heart of a mother uh, that when a child is hurting, whether it be a physical hurt or whether it be an emotional hurt, or whether it be any other kind of mental hurt or, or relationship hurt, uh, that the mother sometimes suffers equally or greater. I know it's not our habit for ladies to say amen, but I think some of you could, in your heart at least, say amen to that. You know the feeling of an agonizing mother. And uh, here is this woman who has a daughter who is... Uh, not just vexed with the devil, but the Bible uses the word grievously vexed with the devil, which means that her condition was, uh, was severe and her condition was dreadful. And can you imagine this mother watching this devil vex her daughter? Uh, the word vex means to trouble. And so I, thought, I started to think in my mind, what did this mother have to witness in this demon, this devil troubling her daughter? The Bible doesn't tell us what that would have looked like. Was it emotional troubling? Was it physical troubling? Was it uh, almost seizure or, or, or that kind of troubling? We don't know. But it must have vexed this mother's heart and brought her to agony uh, when she saw that her daughter was so very vexed. I want to say a word to our young people. And I, I, I believe this is fitting. I'm very proud of our young people and the teenagers of our church. And, and, and um, But I... I I, I was really impressed with the preacher this week at camp, Brother Tom Farrell, at least for the teenagers. He uh, was very blunt, uh, and blunt is good, uh, especially for young people. And in his bluntness, he, he, uh, uh, he challenged them to follow God and walk with God. And uh, even very, very aggressively told them the dangers and the woes and the pain that is there when you do not follow God. And there is pain when you, don't, when you don't follow God. I remember one evening he preached on Samson. Samson wanted to live for himself. And all he did was suffer pain through his life. Until at the end, even in his, even in his last act, he's still thinking about himself. Avenge me of mine enemies. He says, let me put my hands on these pillars and avenge me of my eyes. Uh, he cries unto God and God allows it. But to watch the train wreck, Samson's life was a train wreck. And why was Samson's life such a train wreck? Because he walked away from God. I, if I could say a word uh, here tonight to our young people, not only does it hurt the heart of God, and not only is there damage to, to uh, your life, young people, as you walk away for the Lord, from the Lord, or if you walk away from the Lord, but for many of you, if you walk away from God, and it's your choice, I, the preacher said several times this week, it's your choice. But I, it would do us good to remember for some of you, you walk away from God, it will destroy your mother's heart. There may be some mothers here tonight whose children are away from God. And right now, you're feeling the pain of a wayward child. It's sort of like seeing a, a devil vexing your child and the world tearing apart the life of your you see them as a little boy or little girl. They may be 40 or 50 years old, but you see the, still see them as your little boy, your little girl. And your heart is broken because the devil of the world is vexing them. 
I, uh, I think it's good for a young person to grow up and say, I, 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 don't, I, don't, want to, I don't want to shame my mother. The book of Proverbs talks about that. It says that a foolish son is a heaviness. Remember? A foolish son is a heaviness to his mother. And I believe it's a healthy thing for young people. And, and some individuals taught me this when I was young. They said, uh, don't, don't put extra burdens upon your mother because of foolish living. And I'm not saying that this daughter here in this text, I'm not making that parallel, that somehow she was, there, was, there was foolish living in her life. All I'm trying to make the, the application is there was an agonizing mother in our story. And any time a child is, is, uh, is uh, in pain, it, it hurts the mother. So this agonizing mother in verse 22, who is from a pagan city, a non-Jewish city, she is a Canaanite, not a Jew. She comes to the Lord Jesus and says this, and, and I, I, I want to present something to you and, and uh, at least share with you how, how I examine it and how I perceive it. She said in verse 22, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And here's my opinion. That doesn't sound like the words of a Canaanite woman. It just doesn't. Um, and we, we've already read the context of these verses, so we know that the context of these verses is she is a Gentile and a woman is coming to Jesus Christ, the Jew, the Messiah, the, 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 the uh, one of Israel. So she's an outsider coming in and asking help. And I believe she in her own heart is thinking, you know, he probably won't help me because I am not a Jew. Why would he heal my daughter? She had heard some stories of others in Israel being healed. Why would he heal my daughter? So here's my take on it. I believe she... Uh, had an appealing method, not only an agonizing mother, but an appealing method. I believe, and it looks like for me in the text, that she comes to Jesus and decides this, I'm going to talk Jewish. Maybe she even dressed a little different. All with the desire to impersonate, if you'll allow me to use that word, maybe to impersonate a little bit of Jewishness in the hopes that if I can phrase it really well, I will practice, I will practice what I'm going to say. And as I read this, listen how she might practice. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Maybe she practiced. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. And practice how she's going to say it. How she could say it in the most appealing way uh, to Jesus the Jew. And when she said this to the Lord... In verse 23, what is Jesus' response in verse 23? But he answered her not a word. Ignore. Ignore. Maybe she said it over and over. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Ignore. Ignore. If you're like me, it sort of sounds harsh. It, it sounds cruel. Jesus, why are you ignoring her? The signal was given to the disciples because Jesus is ignoring her that they finally give their advice and suggestion to say, send her away. I don't want to hear her cry after us anymore. Why is Jesus somewhat rough or harsh? Why is he seemingly cold toward this woman? I wrote in my notes, maybe his roughness is because of her fakeness. Maybe her roughness is because of her fakeness. In order to peel away the facade or to peel away the, the, the layers of, of impersonation, the silence was necessary to get past the pretending. Have you ever heard the phrase, fake it till you make it? Can I tell you, church, that never works with God. And here's why it never works with God. 
We, we can do the fake it till you make it in some things in life that you really have to learn. There's a learning curve to it. Like say, for instance, you're, uh, you, you, know, you, you got a new job and you got to type up these reports and you're just really learning how to type up these reports and it's pretty in depth and, and you're not the best at it, but they may say, just fake it till you make it. It'll eventually come to you. You'll eventually learn, but until you learn it well, just fake it along. Some people play some sports and they're like, yeah, I'm not really too good at this thing. Well, just fake it till you make it because if you play it long enough, you'll get a little better. You'll You'll improve and you can, and, and then you won't have to fake it anymore because you would have learned. Here's the problem with, with spiritually faking it till you make it it's because approaching God is not hard. Approaching God is not a learning curve. The only thing that God has ever wanted is sincerity and truth. If you remember the very first message we looked at, in, uh, uh, regarding worship was when Jesus told the woman, they that worship him must worship him in sincerity and truth. And, and I just envisioned this woman coming with her fakeness, maybe her desire to have her daughter healed, and this is her plan. She's put together this whole plan that she comes with a little bit of pretending and Jesus just gives her silence. I believe God never responds to pretenders. And we have a hard time figuring out who the pretenders are. But God doesn't. God knows who the pretenders are tonight. He knows. He knows. A person can grow up in a Christian home. A person can have Christian parents and even Christian grandparents. And that young person can still pretend. And uh, by the way, at camp this week, there were many young people saved and born again. I, 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 a, a large crowd of young people came out to be dealt with regarding salvation. And, and in some ways, the preacher preaches pretty hard about, about making sure that you're saved. And I guess sometimes I look at that and say, you know, maybe he's a little too rough. Maybe he's trying to put, put it, the, 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 the requirements too hard on salvation. But I'd rather have a young person sure than unsure. Our missionary that was here this morning in the teen class, I had heard his testimony. I said, come in the teen class, talk to these teens. So we, he went in there and he said, uh, I, I said, I made a profession when I was really young, but he said, uh, that profession was in a junior church setting. And he said, nobody really dealt with me well. And he said, uh, I just felt like I was sort of pushed through this, this uh, system. And he said, I, I wasn't saved. And he said, it wasn't until I was 16 or I believe he said 16, maybe 17 years old. He said, I was so afraid to really trust the Lord as my savior. He said, I was afraid, not for myself. He said, I know what I wanted. I wanted to get saved. I was afraid of what everybody else will think. And so he said, I pretended. I pretended in my 9-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old year, 13, 14, 15, pretending, 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 pretending. And he even said, I would witness to people about the Lord. I'd tell people about Jesus. And all the time it come to back my, to my mind, I've never accepted him myself. I'm pretending. The Lord Jesus knows who pretends. She may have practiced her lines and tried to portray herself as Jewish as she possibly could, but the Lord Jesus can see the pretending, and God always, always responds with silence to the pretender. As we attempt to fake our way through our Christianity, and, and, and we know how to be Baptists, and we know how to be, quote-unquote, Christian, we know our Christian ease. And we know our Christian activities and we know our Christian behavior and we'll be pretending all the way through not really having a relationship with God. I believe this is what made the Pharisees so angry is they tried to make everything right on the outside and Jesus said, but the problem is I see the inside. The pretenders. She was attempting to come to Jesus on someone else's terms, using someone else's terms and copying someone else. Jesus wanted her to come to him as herself. Jesus wanted her to come to him as a woman from Tyre and Sidon, a woman of Canaan, a, a, a woman who's a non-Jew. Jesus wanted her to come to him as herself without pretending. That's why I am, uh, and I'm glad that I was taught this at a, at a young age, uh, that's why it's important not to read your prayers. Because sometimes when you read prayers, you start pretending. You just say some words. I, I was never in the Catholic Church, but some of you were. And I know that uh, in the Catholic faith, prayers are read. You get a book of prayers. And you start to go through those pages, and you read the prayers. 
And I've, talking, I've, I've spoken to some Catholic individuals who later got saved in life and said, I read those prayers, but they were just words on a page. That's it. Just words on a page. And pretending. God doesn't want your pretending, and God doesn't want your manipulating. This woman would have no success. All she would get from Jesus is silence if she tries to approach him through a Jewish door. She didn't have to approach Jesus, Jesus through a Jewish door. And by the way, you don't have to approach Jesus through a Baptist door. But you do need to approach Jesus through a sinner door. Through that door. <clears throat> Jesus had just come through Judea and Jerusalem and different parts of the region of the Jews. And this was interesting as I made this connection. Here is a woman of Canaan. A Gentile woman, Tyre and Sidon, she is seeking the Lord. But go back, if you would, to chapter 13 and verse 57 and find out what had just uh, transpired uh, in the ministry of Jesus. 1357. All right, in verse number 57. And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many works there because of their unbelief. Does anybody know where that was? That was in Nazareth. The place where Jesus should have been accepted and loved and championed and worshipped and praised and followed and listened to and, and sought after. In fact, he says, I can't even stay here because these people don't believe at all. And there's no mighty works that I can do here. Here's what I'm saying. This woman trying to be Jewish to approach the Lord, she didn't realize that Jesus had just seen many Jews who were not accepting of him. Uh, in, our, in our chapter, in chapter 15, we see the same thing. In verse number 10 of chapter number uh, 15 of uh, the book of Matthew. Uh, 1510, and he called the multitude and said unto them, hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Jesus had already met with plenty of rejection. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And those were Jews. And now this woman is thinking, I'll be successful if I'll come to him as a quote-unquote Jew, if I'll manipulate and make this method. I'll put together this plan. And all the time, Jesus may be saying, I will not respond to you until you come to me in sincerity and truth. And tonight, dear brother or sister, in our worship of Christ, let's not pretend. And I mean that for me and for all of us. Let's not pretend. Let's not come to Christ and worship and, and, and figure that we've got our, our master plan of how we'll manipulate him to answer our prayers or how we'll manipulate him to, to meet our need or how we'll manipulate the circumstances to be perceived as something that we're not. All the Lord God has ever wanted is sincerity and truth. And here's the good news in our text as I give you this last point. This woman did come sincerely and truthfully. In chapter 15, Jesus keeps his silence in verse 23. Answers are not a word. Disciples say, send her away, uh, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of uh, Israel. Now look at verse 25, and here's the word worshiped. Then came she... And worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Do you sense that being more real than the previous verse? I mean, than the statements she made before. The statements she made before sound rehearsed. They sound planned. They sound practiced. But in verse 25, there's a realism there, this particular woman did get real as she worships him and she does not worship him in a fake way now she's worshiping him in a real way and her words are much shorter maybe not as polished but her words are more sincere and more truthful and she simply says lord help me help me 
Verse 26. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Now, if that would have been you or me, just think about this tonight. If that would have been you or me and we'd have been called a dog, we'd have probably said, what did you call me? Right? What did you just, did, did you just call me a dog? But you don't see that being her response. What was her response? Two words. In verse 27. And she said, truth, Lord. She was an agonizing mother. She comes with an appealing method that just received silence from Jesus. But now she has an arresting modesty. Instead of saying, what did you call me? She says, you're right. You're right. The Lord Jesus rejects pretending he rejects insincerity and he always rejects pride he rejects non-truth he rejects insincerity and he always rejects pride so this was a test is she going to be the entitled one will she portray herself as being entitled uh, have you noticed in society we have become an entitled society an entitled, entitled, entitled society. We throw around phrases like, uh, your rights have been violated. It sounds so desperate, doesn't it? Your rights have been violated. Uh, you know, there are some scriptures and verses and hymns that call us some pretty detestable names. I remember when I was at the nursing home singing some songs for some individuals there, we'd walk around and sing. And we started singing Amazing Grace. I think I've told you the story. And this woman said, stop it, stop it, stop it. And I, I, thought, I thought we were singing pretty good. I didn't think it was that bad. She says, stop it. Don't sing that song. I said, why not sing that song? Because she says, that song calls me a wretch. And I don't like it. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. There's other scriptures that were called a worm. I don't, that's a little bit lower than a wretch, I think. The Bible calls us a worm. In this worship that this woman honored the Lord Jesus with, when she came with sincere worship and truthful worship and pulled away the, the, the shell of her facade, now she is being truthful, and the Lord Jesus wants to test pride. He wants to test humility. He wants to see if she is coming with modesty, if she is coming with brokenness. And he says, I cannot take the children's meat and cast it to the dogs. And she says, truth, Lord. Could it be that in Christianity today, we're not happy with crumbs? Could it be that maybe our Christianity becomes a little too high class, a little too prideful, that we begin to say to God, God, I should sit in a better place at that seat. I, I should sit maybe at the head of the table. I should get a large portion of the blessings of God. Can I ask you tonight, are, are, are there times in our life when we really feel entitled to this point? I should have big blessings from God. I should have huge benefits from God. And the Lord Jesus said, how about some crumbs? Would you be happy with that? And I'm asking you and I, if God just gave us crumbs, would we still worship him? If he just said, I'll just give you just a small little portion, would we say, Lord, I worship you with all my heart? Thankful for the young people mentioning bitterness. Bitterness can creep in so fast, right, brothers and sisters? It can creep in so fast. And not just our bitterness toward one another, but bitterness can creep in toward God. He took my health, and he had no right to take my health. He didn't answer my prayer request, and I've been praying for so long, and this other guy prays for two days. He gets his prayer request answered, and I've been praying for so long and still nothing. 
Uh, he took my loved one away. I, I, I wanted my loved one to, to make it through the surgery or the illness, or I wanted my loved one to stay close, and now they're gone. And it just seems like all of the, 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 the buffet of the blessings of God aren't here, and I'm not happy with just crumbs. Part of why this woman was so blessed by the Lord Jesus is because she came with such humility that she was happy with crumbs. I listened to a song this afternoon. I just, as I was trying to get this message in my mind, it's a song that simply says, uh, you do not owe me a thing. If you can find it on YouTube, it's sort of a song that's a little bit repetitive, but it just simply says over and over, God, you don't owe me a thing. Lord, you don't owe me a thing. And you've already given me everything by dying on the cross. And you don't owe me a thing. This woman was happy with the crumbs. She was happy with whatever the Lord Jesus would do. And pride is always a problem. In Luke 18, I read it again just for my own um, uh, perspective. Do you remember there were two people that prayed in Luke 18? And one was a Pharisee who stood there in chapter 18 and verse number 9 and said, Lord, I thank thee that I'm not like these other people. Remember? He said, I, I fast twice in the week. And I thought about that. Fasting twice a week is pretty amazing. I fast twice a week, he said, and I give alms of all that I possess. And then there was that publican. Everybody despised publicans. The Bible says that that publican just beat on his chest like this and said, God be merciful me a sinner and Jesus said that man went down to his house justified and not the other because Jesus always rejects pride always God does not owe us a thing God did not owe this Canaanite woman a thing would the Lord Jesus send her away I think it's a valid question as we close. You say, would it be possible that Jesus would send her away? The Bible says that all that come to me, I I will in no wise cast out. So we will say, well, would the Lord Jesus send her away? And and this was my conclusion as I read this. If she'd have maintained her insincerity, and if she would have maintained her untruthfulness, and if she would have been prideful, I believe the Lord Jesus could have sent her away with zero healing. Now she comes in a different way. Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And then Jesus answered and said unto her, this is verse 28, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very Yes, she did get truthful, and yes, she did become sincere, and yes, she did approach the Lord Jesus humbly, and at that very moment, her daughter was healed, and that devil was gone, and her prayer was answered. So I've said all that to say this, how was our worship? Maybe we come to the Lord at times with our own fakeness. Well, I know how to pray, I pray a lot of times, I can throw some phrases in here and some things that I've learned over the years. I, uh, we, we, even be, we even pick up on phrases that someone else prays, and we say, we say, well, that phrase sounds cool. I'm going to use that in my prayers. Am I right? That's a cool prayer phrase. I'm going to start using that prayer phrase. L- let me make my admission. Sometimes when I hear someone else preach, I'll say, ooh, that's a good way to say something. I'm going to start saying it that way. God doesn't want me to pray somebody else's words in my prayer. And God doesn't want me to preach somebody else's words in my sermon. And God doesn't want me to worship using someone else's terms or someone else's uh, 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 method of operation so that maybe I, I, I might uh, get a little more appeal to him. God has always wanted us to come with sincerity and truth and humility. And that's the best way to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. So tonight, is our worship of the Lord Jesus that way? Can we come to him raw instead of rehearsed? 
instead of rehearsing what we're going to say, let's just come to him raw. Let's come to him real. Let's worship him in the spirit of truth and see if the Lord Jesus won't turn from silence to blessing. I thought, how could this woman, how unnerving must it have been for her to cry out so passionately and for Jesus to say nothing. Have you ever been ignored? If I bring this too close, have you ever been ignored? Uh, every mother says, yes, I have. <laughs> I have been ignored by uh, husbands and children, and I've spoken and nobody has even heard. So it happens. But uh, could you think about this tonight? And I'm going to close right here. You ever feel like your prayers are being ignored? Just trying to, I know this stings a little bit. Have you ever felt like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm on my knees and it just seems like all I'm getting is silence. I know we can't apply this test in a, in a, in a, in a, in a black and white kind of way. But it's just for consideration tonight. Maybe it's our untruthfulness. Maybe it's our insincerity. Or maybe it's our pride. And God says, you know, until that's gone, it's just going to be silence. Until that's gone, the worship really won't be heartfelt. Until that's gone, you maybe won't even feel my hand of touch and blessing and moving in your life. Let's not fake it till we make it. Let's just make it real and experience the joy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can we bow for a word of prayer tonight? If you would do that with me and, and for me and together.